So this is totally awesome. The fact that I can get a room with this many people on a talk about debugging PowerShell, that like gets me totally excited. I've been, I propose talks on PowerShell. I mean, I've been doing PowerShell for years now. And I propose talks that go deep on stuff that I work on, that I care about. And I get so many conferences to look at that and say, mm, nah, it's not for our audience. But the fact that I can do that here is fantastic. And to get this crowd a night after there was an open bar, incredible. <laughs> So, um, the talk is about debugging PowerShell, tips, tricks, tools, uh, the kind of things that are going to help you in your debugging skills. Um, just to uh, give you a bit of details about me, my name is Kirk Monroe. I'm currently working as Director of Learning Solutions at Learn On Demand Systems, where I do a lot of not PowerShell stuff. But for the past 10 years, or uh, 10, yeah, give or take 10 years, um, I have been focused prior to working with our on-demand systems hardcore on PowerShell. And uh, so I've been working on Power GUI, I've been working on just on my own modules. And, and when I say hardcore, I mean 100%. My entire career and my hobby was PowerShell. So I spent an obscene amount of time dealing with a language since version one. And uh, that's given me certain insights into things that you might not realize or think about when you are um, working with PowerShell and doing debugging. And a lot of people are anywhere between, well, I think the majority of people are probably between one and five years experience. North of five, you're, you're really not gonna get that many numbers. Just curious, in this room, how many people have been using PowerShell more than five years? Okay, that's awesome too. Um, but still, uh, yeah, this, this talk is gonna give you some insight into things that I find that are useful for me for debugging. And I think that uh, some of them you're gonna resonate with, other ones are gonna fly over your head and they're gonna say, no, that's not for me yet. But I like exposing that to you guys so that later on you can think back, oh yeah, and the light will turn on. I saw that in another session and I can start pulling those techniques in um, myself. Hmm? Already did. Yeah. Um, so uh, the handle I go by is Poshaholic. So on Twitter at Poshaholic, Poshaholic at gmail.com, Poshaholic at hotmail.com, Poshaholic.com. Uh, you can find me around the web using that. Uh, and I've been a PowerShell MVP for the past 10 years and, and still going, and it's, it's great fun. Now, so the agenda, I pretty much talked about this already. Uh, debugging skills, debugging demos, um, some native content, that's PowerShell version five, uh, talking about what you can do pre-version five and some limitations and showing you how some of my own work helps get past some of those limitations when it comes to debugging and also talking about tips, recommendations and best practices. So that's more or less it on the slide front. I mean, I've got some resources later on, but uh, this is about debugging and I'm not gonna show you how to debug from a slide deck, so I'm just gonna spend most of the time in demos. And by the way, questions anytime, just raise your hand, speak up, and if, if I'm looking down, I don't see you, just holler my name, and uh, please bring them up and uh, I'll address them as they come up. Now, let me... How's that for reading in the back, the font size? Good. Okay, so the first thing I always talk about when I'm talking about debugging, and this is going to sound basic for those of you who have done some debugging or soft skills, but they still apply. Um, and a lot of people don't think about this stuff, and so I, I like to go through it on a debugging talk because it's stuff that, these are just techniques that it doesn't matter what language you're working with, some of the stuff applies. Um, but particularly PowerShell, let me just clean up my environment a little bit, so I'm just going to reset my, uh, my color scheme. And so, one of the first problems that I run into, and you guys probably hear this, you provide somebody in your organization with a PowerShell script or function or module and you tell them how to use it, and they inevitably come back to you and say, there was an error. And you say, okay, what was the error? And you, they say, it was red. <laughs> right? So it's, it's, a, it's an amazingly, totally mental game, right? The people who run into this problem, the text right there, says exactly what the problem is, but it's red. And so they can't get past the fact that it's a red error, they don't read the text, they, and it's PowerShell, they don't know PowerShell, so they don't even try. And so you can help that, and it's a silly thing, but it actually makes a big difference. And since I've done it, I love it. And you can change the error, uh, the error color. And so inside of PowerShell IC, um, I find that so much more readable, jumps out on the page at me, I can very quickly identify the text that's on there, and it doesn't have that ominous red glow. Um, another one, and there's no code for this one. Anybody here the expression talk to the bear or to the rubber duck or your favorite stuffed animal? So how many times do you have a problem with something and you get up from your desk or your cubicle and you walk over to your coworker and 
you articulate the problem to them, and in the process of articulating that problem to them, you have a solution in your head like that. Just because you put the words in front of you, and your brain hears them back, and it realizes, oh, wait a minute, never mind, I'm going to go fix that. And so, yeah, some people say keep a stuffed animal at your desk and just kind of articulate the problem, and it's silly talking to yourself, but it helps you get problems solved. I work at home, so nobody else hears me, so I can talk to myself all I want. Um, another thing, so let me just, um, I'm just going to load up this function. Priming the pump, just it's um, basically just creating a bunch of errors. So load up my function, and then I'm going to run that. I just wanted to load up the um, error variable with some stuff. So sometimes, well, first of all, you guys probably already know this. When you uh, get errors, and whether you see them or not, um, unless they're ignored, if they're just silent errors, they are all stored inside of the error variable. And so you can show that and go through those errors, which can be daunting, and especially if there's uh, dozens or hundreds, and, and there's a fair amount in this case, there's only 20, but uh, still, trying to figure out what's going on here can be challenging. And so knowing how to deal with the error variable um, can be really useful. And so errors are objects, like everything in PowerShell, and they have properties and methods. And so you can take advantage of those properties in, on those objects to make that error information more consumable, so if I'm, I'm just going to move this up a little higher so it's easier to see in the back. Um, so yeah, so to make that error less overwhelming and also prioritized and actionable, you can just be a little bit smart about how you show those errors. So if I run this, now you can see I've got eight of a certain type of error and it gives me just the text of what that error was. It gets rid of all the lines, all of the, all the stuff related to a file and a line number and all that stuff, the noise, and gives you an idea of what the errors were before you go even thinking about its code and, and what the problem might be behind the scenes, right? So just leveraging properties and using built-in PowerShell smart grouping form, uh, format and sorting, you can get a prioritized list and quickly identify the ones you want to tackle first. I mean, sometimes with errors, it's worth looking at the first one because the first one then has a whole cascading effect, right? So don't always just look at the prioritized list. Sometimes you want to look at what the first error was because it's going to cause two, three, four, and five, depending on how the function was written. But other times, you might want to take a look at big picture. What are all my problems? Well, I can knock out these errors with a simple change and go make that change, and then work through your list and keep knocking them off one by one. Make sense? OK. Now, um, jump back over. Um, also, when you're dealing with errors, let me just make sure something first. Do I have my modules loaded? Yeah. So I have some modules that help me out with some stuff, and I'm just going to take those out of the picture for, for the time being, uh, just to demonstrate a point. So when you have an error, mess, an error, right? So I can look at error zero by itself. I talk about looking at the first one. So the first one's going to be the error zero. And you can clear your error list from time to time as you deal with stuff, which is useful. So that's interesting. But that doesn't give me all the details behind the error. And so I can pipe that to format list because this is PowerShell, right? Except maybe not. Because PowerShell has this interesting way, in interesting, um, way of deciding certain objects, even if you say you want them formatted a certain way, it knows better. It thinks you really want to just see this information. And errors are one of those objects. There's a handful of them in there. Exceptions is another one. But you can be smarter than that. Use the force. And so then, <laughs> no PowerShell, you don't know better, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so here you can see the breakdown of your properties and get into more of the details. And there's an exception property and there's all this, all this useful information that you can use to try, to try to analyze your errors. So there's exceptions, which just shows you some text. Except it's an object, right? So you can look at it. But again, because it's an exception, you have to use the force. So just remember using dash force when you're dealing with looking at errors and exceptions and trying to get through this data. Um, and of course, there are also, and not in this particular example, inner exceptions. Now, this particular one doesn't have any. The reason that, so let me back up for a second. The way errors work, somewhere in code, you, you make a function call or a command look call, which goes into something else and into something else, and then down in the bowels of the program, bang, something happens. That generates an error. As that error or as that exception propagates its way, its way back up the stack, some pieces of code take that error and they wrap it inside of another error that's context sensitive to what they were doing. 
and then they send that up the stack. And that can then be wrapped into another one. So you can have, inside of an error, exception, dot, inner exception, dot, inner exception, and so on, before you get to the bottom of what's going on. And a lot of times, you don't care, because the top guy is smart enough to give you the context and the text that tells you what the problem was, and you can figure it out. But sometimes, you look at the text, and you have no idea what's going on, because it's just totally masking the problem from you. The text is not clear. It's not intuitive. So go look. Is there an inner exception? What's that text say? And go down that rabbit hole to see if you can find something that gives you a clue for what the problem is. Because there are certain scenarios where it's totally obvious what the problem is, and you can solve it really easily, but it's just hidden inside of the exception stack. And that's unfortunate, and this just deals with code issues, and that kind of code needs to be cleaned up over time so that they don't necessarily hide those things and, and mask it with uh, errors that are not so intuitive, error messages. But knowing that you can get there is important. It's really, it's not very often I've had to go into that level and dig through the exception stack, but you might have to, and so it's important to know you can do it. Um, now, if you don't like using the force all the time on your errors, you can use community modules to help that. So um, I have a module called Format PX out there that's on the gallery that does a bunch of cool things with the format system. And, and also one of the things that it does is it makes it so that when you call, uh, when you show your errors and your exceptions, you no longer have to do dash force. You just do dollar sign error, square bracket, zero square bracket, pipe to format list, and you will get a format list. Pipe it to format table, you will get a format table. It doesn't try to make the assumptions for you. So, um, and so you can load it when you want to use it, and unload it when you don't, and whatever, but you can take a look at that. Um, other things that you need to know is leveraging the stack traces. So errors have two different stack traces. They have a script stack trace that shows you what was being called before, you know, function call A, stepped into function call B, stepped into function call C, stepped in my script block. So you can see that path and get a better idea of what was going on when the error happened. And this is, again, just all on these properties that PowerShell hides because it, it thinks it knows better. Um, and then the other one is exceptions also have stack traces. So on the error itself, you've got a property, script stack trace, which is the stack trace inside of PowerShell. And on the exception, you have and there's not in this case because the particular error that I'm looking at doesn't have that, you have an exception stack trace that is the stack trace coming from .NET and code. And both of those are useful when you're troubleshooting the stuff and trying to figure out what's, what's going on. Um, depending on what the problem is, you may have to look at one or the other. A lot of times, if it's just PowerShell, then it's just the script, script stack trace is all you need and you'll be good. Um, you can clean up behind yourself, I mentioned, as you deal with errors. So I can remove a specific one. I can remove at a certain range by in, uh, or using a range by index. Or I can clear the entire list. So I'll just clear my error list to clean up after myself, assuming I get rid of all my errors. And then I can run something again, look at the error stack, see what's going on, or the, the error collection, see what's going on, and then continue. It, it, it's just a good practice to follow, right? If you leave error alone, it's just going to grow on and on and on and on. But when you're dealing with errors, clean up when you fix them, and then do it again. I mean, you can refresh your environment and go in again, and you'll have error, uh, your error variable clear, and then run your scripts. And that's actually a good practice, because if you have any state in your environment, it can influence the behavior of what you're calling. So uh, you might want to close your PowerShell window and reopen it and rerun. But a lot of times, you don't need to do that. And when you're doing interactive, fast work through functions and scripts, just clear your error. Uh, collection as, as you're um, going through stuff. Um, what else? Um, try catch. So this is this is an example that I just was chatting with uh, Kevin Marquette because Kevin Marquette just did a blog post recently about exception handling, and uh, it didn't highlight certain key points. And a lot of people don't realize that this is a problem, and that it's easy to resolve. And so I want to highlight it here and share it with you guys. So this is just simple code, right? I'm taking one and I'm dividing it by zero because that's going to work. And then I'm just going to, after that, write, will this run to my command line? So if I run that by itself, I can see my error divided by zero error. But the text, will this run, still shows up. So it was not a terminating error, right? <coughs> Except if I wrap it inside of a try catch. And so let me load this up. And now, if I run test something, I got my error. But I didn't get my will this run text, because all of a sudden, the non-terminating error is terminating. 
And there are some cases where PowerShell will, will do this, where it's not going to terminate if an error happens unless it's wrapped inside of try catch, which is something I really don't like. And so what I do in literally every single function I write, every begin block, process block, and block, every script that I write, well, scripts, it depends. But in general, I will always use a try catch at the top level, do all of my logic inside of my try statement, and then in my catch, I do nothing other than call ps commandlet dot, dot throw terminating error. Let me compare two things here. So let me show you test something number two, because there's two different versions of the same code, right? So I want to just load these up. And so take a look at uh, version one. Version one calls into, or just generates the error, and then catches the exception and calls ps commandlet dot throw terminating error. Test something two does the same thing, except it just calls throw by itself. Because when you're dealing with try catch, if you call throw, a naked throw with no parameters, it's going to take whatever the exception was it got and just throw it up higher up the chain so that it'll be, I'm not handling it, I'm just going to let somebody else handle it, let it go up the, up, up the stack. The reason why you want to do the first one and not the second one is because you need to think about who the exception message is for. If you're writing your code and you're debugging your code, the exception message is for you and you want to know what line it happened on inside of your function and go and do the work to fix that. But the moment you take your code and you put it out in the community or you give it to your peers and you say, this just works, use it. And they go and write code against this using some PowerShell scripts, scripts and automation. If you're just doing throw, then the error messages that they receive are going to reference line numbers and locations inside of your code rather than referencing the call that they made that generated the error. And that's the key difference. If you look at, um, think about commandlets versus functions. If you take a commandlet, get service, and it generates an exception, do you want to see the line number inside of get service that actually caused that problem? Or do you want to see that I called get service and they got an error, so I want to look at my parameters, think about what I was doing, and, and be able to work that out? That's the scenario. Same thing with functions. If you call functions and you're not doing this wrapping of try catch for exceptions with the throw terminating error, the exception you get is going to show you inside stuff. But as a consumer of a function, I want that function to be a black box, just like a commandlet, and I want to know in my code what did I call and what parameters did I give it that caused that problem. So I try to pass that on to other people by making sure that I always use the, the throw term in the air. So to show that, if I run, let me run these again. So if I want to test something, you can see that I got an error in my function call to test something, and the error message I got back was the actual error text. If I run the other one, there I got an error on this weird line with one divided by zero at line five, character nine, and it's calling write host, and I didn't write any of that stuff, so what's that doing, right? So that's why I advocate strongly for the first one. Does that make sense to everybody? Any questions about that? Yeah. Yes. Yes, the this, this second information, trying to figure out what's going on, is inside the properties of your error. So you can still debug it. You can still go into the properties and look at all that rich information inside of your invocation information and, and inside the call stack and all that stuff. But you're presenting to the user something that's a lot easier, and if you do it in the right color, they might know what to do about it. <laughs> now, so that's, that's all soft skills, just getting into basic error uh, work. Now let's talk about actual debugging and breakpoints. How many people here already use breakpoints for debugging. Okay, that's great. How many of you, and be honest, use write host and just outputs of text and that sort of thing for debugging? Great. So, um, I want to show the basics of breakpoints for those people, and I'm going to show you a lot of cool things you can do with breakpoints beyond what some of you who are already using breakpoints might have done. So, let me just load up this, uh, oops, this series of functions. So I've just got function A, which does some stuff and calls function B, which calls function C. And then down in, in, in the inside there, there's an error. And so let me just load that up. And now if I hit F8 on A, I didn't get anything back. 
Now, why did it not get anything back at all? Well, right here, there's catch. And in my catch statement, I've got nothing. So at the top level, I'm saying, OK, give me whatever errors you got, and I'm just going to throw them away. So don't do that. Um, <laughs> But um, when you have something like this and you're debugging and there's this code and I ran this and it was supposed to give me this nice output and it didn't and what's going on? So that's when you get, and get into breakpoints and the call stack, right? So I can just put a line breakpoint on A and now I can run this again. So hit F5. And now you see the line number is it's very small here, but it's yellow. All I did, by the way, to hit the breakpoint was I hit F9. So I can turn breakpoints on and off with F9. And you can also go into the debug menu if you forget that shortcut, and you can toggle breakpoint, and it's right there on the top of the menu. So you hit your breakpoint, and now what? Well, I'm on A, but I haven't executed it yet. The way breakpoints work is they stop at the point of execution without running yet. If I flip over to my PowerShell prompt, it shows me I'm in a breakpoint. I'm inside the debugger, so inside of DBG. I'm in the PowerShell debugger, and I can do stuff. And it says I hit a line breakpoint, and it tells me where that line was. And so now, if I hit H and hit Enter, I can see what the debugger is going to let me do. So H is just to get help. I can step into functions, I can step over functions, and I can step out of functions. The way those work, if you think about it, the, the, what they say is what they do, right? If you're on a command that is a function, and you execute step into, which you can do via the menu or just by in, invoking S here, it's going to go inside the function so you can start stepping through that. If you are on a function that you don't want to debug, because you know this part's working and I want to go further, you can step over the function and it's going to go to the next line parallel to where you are. And then the last one is step out, because sometimes when you're debugging, you step into a function, you go a little bit and you realize, okay, I don't need to go further in here, take me up one level on the stack and then keep going. So you can step out of your current function up one level higher in your stack, and then keep debugging from there. So those are the three that you're going to want to use a little bit. Um, step into is probably the one that's most commonly used uh, when you're debugging, but the other ones are good to know about for being able to jump around inside of your code uh, more quickly and not, because sometimes, sometimes you don't, you don't want to step into certain things because it might go into something and then something else and something else, and it's going to take you a long time doing steps to get to where you want to go. So knowing you can step over and knowing you can step out when you step in by accident are useful. Um, I, can, I can hit C to continue, which basically says I'm on a breakpoint. Well, just keep on, keep on running and go until I hit another breakpoint until it's, or until it's done. I can quit to stop my session, so at any time I've figured out what's going on, when I go make changes, I just quit, go back and make my changes, and then rerun. I'll hit my breakpoint, which is still set, and I can debug further. And uh, detach is about when you're doing remote debugging, so I'm not going to talk about that yet. Um, call stack. I can hit K, and I can see where I am in the call stack. There's only one item here, so it's kind of boring. But there could be a whole lot of stuff, and I want to see where I am in the call stack at a certain time. And I also love this one, L. It gives me a view of what's, what I'm looking at in the file. And now it only shows me about, there's about a dozen lines here, with the star showing the current line that I ran. But if it was a larger file, or if I wanted to see a bigger picture, I can indicate I want to see from line, lines 1 to 100, and I will see the contents of the file or the contents of that portion of the stack. Because it might not be a file, it might be a script block, it might be something dynamically generated. Could be all sorts of different things. So you can look around and see a star just to see where you are, no matter what point you're at in the, in the debugger. And then, uh, so that's list, and then, uh, oh yeah. If you're stepping, once I step once, so I'm going to hit S to step into, and I hit enter, it goes to the next point, the next point in line, and actually in this, for this to work better, I'll do a split view. So there you see I'm on function A. Now if I hit enter, it's going to rerun step into. So now I can look up top and watch line by line as I go through the code, right? Which is really easy. I'm just hitting enter each one, one at a time. I don't have to hit. I mean, I can use F11 or whatever, but enter is really easy. And then, OK, let's say at this point, I want to say, OK, well, wait a minute. What's x right now? So I can just invoke dollar sign $x. Oh, x is 2. OK. So you can check state of variables. You can see what's going on inside of your work. So that's the whole point of this, the value of this versus the value of right host. Right host is very useful because I can right host, you know, foolbar, whatever, A, B, and see which parts get executed and get a better idea of what things are going on. 
but more efficient is debugging and breakpointing because you can interrogate the system as it goes through and you can quit and then rerun and you can step through line by line and you get this nice visual view inside of ISC um, showing you what's going on. And, and so I can step through my function and then I can continue stepping through, walk you through it, and then all of a sudden, oh, wait a minute. I told it to step. I actually did step into, but step into on a, on a, on a um, method call it's not going to step into anything because there's nothing to step into. But when I tried to run this, get directory name, it just went out of my function stack. So I'm seeing visually line by line what it's going through without manually running it line by line. And then that gives me a clue that that threw an error. Right? So that's, that's the whole point of, of um, stepping through the code. And the reason why, the, actually, the reason why this next line, why the current line is on this closing curly brace is because there's nothing inside of this catch. If I was stepping and I had something inside this catch and I got that exception, I would be inside of my catch statement and I could look at that exception and see what's going on too. So that's debugging in a nutshell. How'd you get the debugging prompt? Oh, so the debugging prompt shows up automatically as soon as you hit a breakpoint. So just go anywhere in your file, anywhere in your script, hit F9 to turn on a breakpoint, then hit F5. So right now, this is you can see I'm back at the regular prompt. If I hit F5, the moment I hit the, the breakpoint, I'm in a debugging prompt. And that's where I hit H to get the list of commands, and I can use all those commands to do my debugging. Yes? So how does this work with like, you know, binaries, like say, ping something? Can I get any sort of information from those? Well, binaries are black boxes, right? So this, there are debuggers inside of .NET that allow you to step from one environment to another if you have the access to the code and all of the, the internals. But um, inside of PowerShell, you can't go inside of those things. So you'll just see when you're on that line and be able to do some troubleshooting. Sometimes what I'll do is if I have a suspect line, I'll step up to it. And then I'm not going to hit step, but I will copy the line and I'll run it. And I'll look at my output without continuing my script, right? So I can do some experimentation. So in cases where I have a black box and I want to try a bunch of things, I will experiment before I execute that command. And that way I can see what's going on in my interactive session and then maybe figure out what's going on from there. Yes? So I find the split screen of the ISE very useful, but sometimes I have to debug code that's meant to run inside of Exchange Shell. Yes. Um, which sort of forces me to go back and use setps breakpoint, which is not nearly as friendly. Um, is there some better way of doing that, or is that pretty much what I'm well, no, there's not. I have a utility that lets you do some stuff, and I'll get to that. Um, but setps breakpoint is, is really powerful and useful. And by the way, you guys should know that when you're hitting F9, it's running this PowerShell command let called set dash ps breakpoint. And all I'm setting are what's called a line breakpoint, which basically tells the, the debugger to stop on that line. There's also command breakpoints. So if I know somewhere in my code I've got a call to stop service that's going wonky, I can do set dash ps breakpoint and set the command name, stop service, and then run. And I won't see a visual red marker in my file that there's a breakpoint there because it's a command breakpoint anywhere that a command shows up. And it will stop at that point, enter my debugger, and I can continue the work. Yeah, so as far as debugging uh, PowerShell scripts running in other applications is concerned, if you're using PowerShell v5, you can use the enter ps host process yes. to jump into another process based on the process ID. Then you can debug scripts that are running in that process from within the ISC or and I'll show that. Yeah. No, that's fine. Um, other questions so far? Yeah? If you're in the, the debugger, can you set an additional or PS breakpoints to set point? Or do you yes. Okay. Oh, yeah. At any time, I can set and remove breakpoints. So if I, if I can do get dash PS breakpoint down here, I mentioned the command set PS breakpoint. Well, I can do get to see what's there. I could set dash PS breakpoint, and I could do a command, uh, and I want to set it for stop. Uh, whoops. Stop service. And so now if I call stop service, I would hit that breakpoint. And I can also remove that breakpoint. So remove dash ps breakpoint. Uh, this is all just command line stuff. Um, and by the way, um, typing these is, uh, is annoying because they're long. But there is uh, SBP for set breakpoint, uh, GBP for get breakpoint, RBP for remove breakpoint. So it's nice short aliases to remember. Um, and makes it a lot easier than typing in those long command names. Yes, that's right. Yeah, so Visual Studio Code, I, I didn't want to demo that here because my fingers haven't yet learned all the shortcuts and sequences and the way to use it yet. But I see I'm very familiar, so I just chose this one. Um, but yeah, you can do a lot of this stuff in Visual Studio Code. It's got some cool uh, extra features to show you call stack and whatnot. Yeah? I'm assuming you, you can do conditional breakpoints. So under the condition of variable equals y, z, or x, 
Yes. That's when it's blowing up, and, I'll, and, and I don't need to step through everything. I can just say, hey, drop me into a breakpoint at that point in time. Yeah, absolutely. So if you look at um, <coughs> get help set ps breakpoint, and you look at the syntax, oh, sorry, I get help, uh, get command. And so there are three different variants of this. The first one is your line breakpoint. The second one's for commands. I talked about that. The third one's variables. And notice that for each one of them, there is this action script block. The action script block is just a script block that's where you could put a condition. So you could put dollar sign i dash eq2 and check if your variable i equals 2. And so you could do that inside of an if, if statement and then use the break command to say, yes, I want to break. If, it does, if your script block does not invoke the break command according to the logic, then it won't stop on that breakpoint. So you can use conditionals. Um, and I've got, I think, a little bit easier way to use conditionals that I'll show you. But um, anyway, that's, that's something that's an option as well. So um, by the way, I will be around after this as well if there are additional questions. But because there's half an hour left, I want to keep on going so I can go through all of the demos. Um, so that's breakpointing 101. Now let's talk about um, entering the debugger without breakpoints. So flip back to full screen here. So this is a really simple uh, piece of code that goes into an endless loop and just starts spinning out gathering events. And it, and it never stops, right? And so endless loops, loops are no fun because your code's running. It seems like it's doing nothing. Uh, and you might think that it's uh, stalled, but it might just be running in a loop. And so I'm just going to run this. So I've got this running, and it's just going to go gather some information. In this case, the information is irrelevant, doesn't matter. So these zeros that are showing up in the output, you can ignore them. Uh, it just means there's no events of those types in my log right now. And, um, and it does a sleep. So it goes and gets some information, sleeps, and then continues. But here's the comment I put at the bottom here. I can press Control B, and this is a PowerShell version 5 thing. Uh, I can press Control B to enter the breakpoint at any time. So if I just go Control B, then the next time that it gets a moment where it can, it's going to stop into the debugger and allow me to debug. So you could have a long running script and you're wondering where it's at. You might think it's gone off into space and not coming back again. And if you have access to that script running inside of a session, where well, you can control D and, and enter that. And once you're here, you're in the debugger. So I can hit H. I can look at my code. I can see the call stack. All of those same skills. And actually, this is something I really want to highlight. Those skills I showed you in just the debugging 101 apply everywhere you can do PowerShell debugging because as soon as you enter the debugger, all those things apply. If you're doing remote debugging, if you're debugging in another process, if you're debugging jobs, if you're debugging um, DSC, all these things you get access to a debugger and these commands and stepping and, and all this cool stuff. So that's... Um, so yeah, here I'm debugging. I can, of course, step through my code line by line. I can see what, which line number it's on. I can, if I'm, even if I'm doing just, even if I'm just in the native PowerShell host, right? Not in ISC, I don't have a file open. I can still debug and I can look around. So now I'm on the call to write output. Well, let's step one line and look around. Now I'm on line number eight. So you can track your progress even without a, a GUI to show you a line marker moving line by line, which is useful. And then you can hit Q, because this is a process that's going to run forever, and just stop it from running, because Q will not just leave the debugger, but it'll stop the process that's currently running that it is debugging. Next up. So there's this command in Power, that was added to PowerShell version 5 that's pretty cool called wait debugger. Wait debugger is really useful when you have something that you know is wonky, and where you're running it, you want to be able to come in at a certain point at a specific point and, and debug it. But you can't just set the breakpoint and hit F5 to run it because it's running elsewhere on another system, inside of a job, inside of a remote run space, one of these things, right? So you can put this wait debugger command. And here I've made a conditional just by wrapping it inside of an if statement. So if I've got this variable, this is another loop, the same loop I showed you. Or no, actually, sorry, uh, slightly different. Um, but so I've added i equals 0. And then each time I go through my loop, I'll just add one to i. And at the point that i is greater than or equal to 5, I want to debug at that point. So if I run this, it's going to take a second, goes through two, two second pause between each iteration of the you know, data, and then boom, I'm in the debugger. But it's a little weird because I talked about the fact that when you hit a breakpoint, you stop before you execute that line. 
But in this case, wait debugger is not a breakpoint. Wait debugger is basically saying, when I invoke this, stop execution, but I can't stop it on wait debugger because it's in the process of running, so it goes to the next line. So that's kind of how wait debugger works. So you won't stop inside of the if block, you'll always stop on the line after, depending on what the line after is. And then, of course, I can do h, and I can get all the goodness of the debugger that I had otherwise. So if you have a, uh, you can use this for remote debugging, which I'm not going to show you because for some reason remoting wasn't working on my system this morning. But um, yeah, so if you can have a process running on a remote system that's running PowerShell, connect into that with wait debugger, enter a breakpoint, and see what's going on. Now, uh, so I'm going to quit that. So I stop the process and go to the next one. So those are cool V5 features I was just showing you about the um, being able to enter a breakpoint anytime and uh, entering the debugger with wait breakpoint. Excuse me, with wait debugger. But now I want to talk about um, debug PX. So <clears throat> one of the things that I do is um, I prefix all of my modules lately with uh, PX because PX looks kind of like RX and I consider my modules remedies for, for common problems. Um, so if you're wondering where the PX suffix comes from, um, that's where it comes from. So I have this module out there on the gallery today called debug PX. And one of the things that it does is it adds this breakpoint command. So with reference to um, exchange, where you're going to run stuff and you don't want to call set PS breakpoint, breakpoint is a command that I wrote that uh, tells the debugger I want to stop here now. Kind of like, we, kind of like wait debug, uh, wait debugger, except it actually stops on that line. So it's similar in that regard, and it's fun, timing was funny because I was working on this at the same time as they were working on PowerShell version 5, and wait debugger came out. And I thought, well, is mine worth it anymore? But yes, well, because it's V3 plus, and also because there are features that I support that they, they don't. And so um, I, still, I still use it, and I still keep it around. One thing that I like about it is I like the visual view, right? I mean, this, isn't an, this is not an F9 breakpoint. This is just the word breakpoint in my file. Or I could use BP as an alias. And so I can see in my file, I could be using Notepad and then running my, my script inside of PowerShell. And Notepad, I can see where my breakpoints are because they're called breakpoint. Um, and so if I hit F5 on this guy, it hits the breakpoint on my breakpoint command. And there's a bit of magic I do to make that actually happen on that command itself. Um, but I like that experience better than going to the next line. And, and so that's the same idea as wait debugger, but V3 plus, which is uh, useful if you're not on V5 yet. And so then from then, I have the same thing applies as, as all the other ones. I'm in the, break, I'm in the debugger, and I can run all of my debugger commands. Now, um, that's just the start of debug PX. There's some other stuff I do that's kind of cool too. So I'm going to load up this function called debug this. Now, let me get that in memory. And so let me talk about what this does. So debug this, if you look at it, it's another one of these infinite loops, right? But there's some interesting things added to it. I've got if debug in here. And I've got my breakpoint command, but with a, with a um, script block. So two things. First, the breakpoint command with a script block. Well, the script block is my condition. But I don't have to do if, and then the expression, and then put break. I just throw whatever I want inside of my uh, script block. And if it evaluates to true, that breakpoint's going to trigger. If it does not, it'll just keep on running. So that allows me to do visual. Um, conditional breakpoints on variables and whatnot, uh, which I find is kind of easy to see in my code. And then I can take them out. And also, there are commands inside of debug PX that allow you to disable the breakpoint command itself. So you can turn them on and off. So you can have breakpoints in your file and then just turn off the, the breakpoint feature just by running um, enable dash uh, breakpoint command. And that will allow me to uh, turn it on and off, enable or disable. So I can debug or not debug. And then the other thing that I threw in is if debug. And the reason why I threw this in is because of this problem. If I, um, let me just run something here. So function, and it's, uh, it's going to have commandlet binding. So it's going to be an advanced function. And pr no parameters. And now I want to just um, say hi to everybody. And so when I run this, um, oops, forgot the function name. And so I can run hello, and sure enough, it says hi to everybody, which is great. And I can run hello dash debug, 
and it does the same thing. Now, what if I had some debug information in here I wanted to use for my own troubleshooting? Well, we know there's this PowerShell has these cool write commandlets, right? So I can do write debug. Um, what's, uh, maybe some useful information, you know. Um, um, the value was false. Um, whatever you would want to put in there, right? So maybe I want to have some nice additional debugging information that can show up when I call this function, but only if I call it with dash debug. And so I can run this. Uh, whoops. Uh, run this. And now if I run hello dash debug, I get my debug output, but also I get this weird continue with this operation like it's a breakpoint. And that bothers me because, well, if you go back in history, PowerShell version 1 didn't have the debugger, and so this was a way to do debugging and, and sort of breakpoints. But everything's evolved since then. There are breakpoints out there. So I don't like the fact that write debug by default will prompt me for actually entering, entering a breakpoint because if I give it to a customer and I say, Mr. Customer, I need the debug information, so run my command with dash debug. I'm never going to do that because I don't want my customer to say, well, I hit a breakpoint. What do I do now? Right? So um, instead of that, let me just halt the command. So what I added to uh, debug PX is this if debug. And so if I run if debug, or if I run my command, debug this with dash debug, then I get my debug output, but it doesn't halt. And so it halted afterwards because it hit my conditional breakpoint, but it's separating out debug output from breakpointing, which I really like. Because now it gives, I can have verbose output and debug output. For, verbose output to me is designed to help them do a bit of troubleshooting on their side when they want to see what's going on. Debug output is to help me figure out what's going on when it's really gone wrong and, and I want to know what the problem is, right? So I can tell them to run with dash debug. And that output, because it's inside of a curly uh, inside of a script block, this stuff can be as expensive as I want performance-wise. It doesn't run unless you invoke the command with dash debug. So it's not going to cause a performance hit. Um, so that's the if debug command. And now another thing that I've done with debug PX. Um, let me load up this function again. So this is a module. I've got this module called uh, debug test. And all it does, so this, this is actually a, what I consider a personal best, best practice for troubleshooting when I create modules, is um, I will always call a naked export module member at the top of my uh, manifest, or sorry, not top of my manifest, at the top, top of my script module, because pretty much all my modules have internal functions, and I don't want those internal functions shared out with people and have them wondering what they are and calling them because it might break things. And so the way I guarantee that I can control what's public, what's private, is a naked call to export module member. And then for the func functions I actually want to share, I explicitly share them with export module member dash function function name. So in this case, I've got this module with two functions, this internal guy set internal stuff, and then this other one called invoke script block. What they do is not that important. I just basically have one public and one private function. So now if I look at the, um, I got the module loaded. If I look at the exports, I only see invoke dash script block because the private one doesn't show up, right? Because I didn't export it. So that's great. And then um, I want to look at the variable that's called hidden secret counter. But I didn't export it, so it does not exist outside of the module scope. The variable is internal, which is good because there's lots of times where inside of a module you might have some internal stuff that you're tracking state, that you're updating things, and you want to know what's, what the current state of the system is, or you're storing a mini database inside of a hash table or whatever. So there's all sorts of things you can do inside of your module to store data that's, that's useful. But then if you need to debug and you want to look at that, what do you do? Well, you can do this weird syntax, get module debug test. And now I can look at hidden, I don't get IntelliSense for it because it's inside secret counter, right? And so I, this syntax is a weird, this weird thing is I'm just dot sourcing. What am I dot sourcing? I'm dot sourcing the module. And I want to run this in the module scope. And so if I do that, uh, you yeah, that should be fine though. If I call it, get module debug test. Oh, anyway. There. 
So that's right. I don't use the syntax often enough because I find it's awkward and clunky, and this is part of the reason why I get errors with it. And so here I just basically said, get my module called debug test, and inside of the scope of that module, run this script block so I can get this hidden secret counter guy. But that's awkward, and now I'm inside of a child scope, and so if I want to get variables or things in the parent scope, I have to use the scope parameter on get variable and stuff, and so that's kind of not so fun. And so what I can do is I can invoke debug-module named debug test, and I'm not in the debugger right now. Yes, I am. So uh, let me quit that. And so now I can debug the debug test module, and what that does is it puts me inside of the debugger in my module scope. And so now I can look at my variables. So hidden, and I have hidden secret counter. And now I can see it. And IntelliSense picked it up. So I can do a lot more exploratory stuff with the power of PowerShell and IntelliSense and all that goodness without the funky module syntax just by calling debug-module in my module name. Um, which is a little out there. And people think, well, you know, I don't do all that stuff yet. But that's where I live and roll. And, and so. Um, I find these tools are useful for my own work that I'm doing, and I want to share them with the rest of the people. Um, and so yeah, so of course, I can just run hidden, I ran the variable to see if it exists. And I can make sure that I'm in the module scope by asking for the variable in scope 0. And sure enough, I am. So there's no uh, magic going on. I'm in the right scope, and I can take a look at what's going on. And then I can just detach from the debugger and get out again. So that lets me go in and see internals of what's going on. Now, let me show you this thing here. So we talked about command breakpoints briefly. I'm going to set a breakpoint on a command that is internal to my module. So I've got a command breakpoint on set dash internal stuff. And now when I call invoke script block, which internally, and I'll go back to the code in a second, calls set internal stuff, I'll hit that breakpoint, right? Except no. And that's by design for the modules I write, because when I ship a module for anything that is internal, I add this line for the actual, uh, as an attribute to the actual function. So system.diagnostics.debugger hidden with curly brackets at the end that adds an attribute to my internal function that tells the debugger, you can't see me. So even if somebody calls set breakpoint with a command name, they're not going to hit this, which is respectful to consumers because your internal function might have the same name as something outside that they're using that they want to debug. And if they do set PS breakpoint command with that name, you don't want them hitting your internal stuff and trying to figure out what's going on. You want them hitting the command that they want to run. So you can turn off debugger for your internals when you ship. And that way, people aren't going to trip over it. Um, there's also this other interesting one here called uh, debugger step through. And so with that, the difference between debugger hidden and de 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 debugger step through is debugger step through will allow me to hit breakpoints if I set them in a script block that I invoke from that function. So it still keeps the internals hidden. I cannot step into an invoke dash script block as long as that's there, which is my intent because I don't want people I, when I ship code, it's a black box. People shouldn't have to step through my code. They should be able to go through the debugger and step through their stuff without having to think, do I need to step in or step over? And, and it's easy to step in where you don't mean to. And so I make it easy to prevent them from doing that accidentally by using debugger step through if I'm going to invoke a script block. Or debugger hidden if I don't want them going to my code and allow them to just be. Because S is step into, right? That's a shortcut, which is easy because we're thinking I want to step. So I can just hit S and enter, 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 and step through stuff that calls my code without going into that code and kind of help that person who's being a little lazy because they're not using step over and thinking about that and make it so they go where they need to go in the debugger. Does that totally confuse you or does that make a little bit of sense? OK. Yes. OK. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so that's, oh yeah. So, um, so I showed how I pass over it. And now if I want to debug inside of that script block, what I could do is I could put a breakpoint in there. Now here I'm just using my breakpoint command, but I could have had this in a save file and hit F9 and, and brand the whole file. And if I have a breakpoint on the line inside of a script block called by, by, called by my invoke script block uh, command, 
it will sure enough hit that breakpoint. So even though I've got that step, um, uh, what's it called, uh, debugger step through set, I can still do breakpoints for my own code because I'm giving a script block to this function and that stuff I wrote, so that's the things I want to debug and I can still debug it. And then let me just detach from the debugger again. Oops. Yeah, that's, that's why I didn't, yeah. So the debugger is a little funky. Um, I hit F8 to run the D command, and it said there is no D command, but that's because when you're in the debugger, and you cannot, you cannot script these debugger commands, like these, um, sorry, uh, not the debugger right now, but what I showed you earlier, the L for list, the S for step through, step over, all those things, you cannot script that stuff. That are, those are special commands that can only be invoked inside of your uh, current host. And now I'm just going to remove those modules from my session just to clean up before I go to the uh, last bit of the demo. So I talked about how you can do jobs briefly. I'm going to, there are only 10 minutes left, so I'm just going to fly through this pretty quick. Um, this is basically just loading up those two scripts I ran at first. Um, so one that had wait debugger and one that did not. And so I'm going to load those up into jobs and get them running. So they're just jobs that are going to uh, uh, run endlessly because they're all endless loops. So I've got a couple of jobs running. And maybe I'm running these background jobs and I want to debug it. Well, I can just call debug job and specify a job ID, and that is equivalent to pressing control B on that job. I showed how you could do control B inside of your current running code, where you can also do control B in a job by invoking debug job. So I do that, and it'll stop, and now sure enough I can look around and step through and do all my debugging. And then quit when I want if I want to terminate or I can just detach. This is where the detach command comes in. I've attached the debugger to a remote thing. I can detach so I can let it continue to run or I can quit and stop it. And so I'll detach. And then the other one that uses wait debugger, when I, de when I hit, when I call debug job, it'll stop on the line after wait debugger. So that's, that's the difference between those two things. But it's the same stuff you guys saw earlier. And um, am I still on my debugger? Yeah, so let me detach again and remove those jobs. And then the last thing, which I can leave for you, uh, I can share this stuff up on, on GitHub and let you guys access it. Um, you can attach to a remote process. Um, uh, well, you mentioned earlier about um, how do I debug stuff that's outside of PowerShell or outside of my current process. Well, you can put PowerShell inside of anything. And so I can have PowerShell running inside of a process, and then I can enter that process. I'm going through this really, really quickly. Uh, enter PS host process. I can look at the run spaces. I can, ent oh, by the way, when you look at the run spaces, you can see one's called remote host. That's how you connected. And the other one's called run spaces one, two, three, and four. That's where the code's running. I can actually debug that. And I actually get the code running in that run space to pop up live in my session, which is really cool because now I have visual debugging and I can use F10 to step through my code and see what's going on. So that's just a very, very, very quick flyby of the really advanced stuff. And I can now do uh, exit dash ps host process, and now I'm out. And that's the entire demo. Thank, thank you, by the way. All, last point on the slides. Um, so I have a slide showing the resources that some of the ones I used. Debug PX is there on GitHub, and install module will get it for you. Uh, snippet PX. Is required by debug PX, and there's the other ones I mentioned format, I didn't mention history, but there's some other ones I find useful. And then uh, contact information for me, anywhere you want to find me online. And whoops, I hit that quickly, but anyway, it says thank you. <laughs> there you go.